It's a great pleasure to be before you today, this afternoon. There will be two more lectures, um, and I'll give you a little bit of a roadmap perhaps at the end as to where we're going. So far, we've been examining a series of seeming paradoxes in Maya imagery and texts, the visual cultures of both, uh, as it was performed by artists, as it was executed by great painters and carvers about 1300 to 1400 years ago in the Yucatan Peninsula. We're living in an age of decipherment. We're living in an age of ever more incisive interpretation, I believe, of, of exactly what these works were intended to project and what was in the minds of their makers. So far, some of the paradoxes have included, as in the first lecture, the idea of static things that nonetheless uh, uh, seem to live. They are not inert, but bound with uh, life. They're abundant in all sorts, sorts of forms of vitality. Another paradox that we examined during the course of these lectures had to do with what were at first um, best understood as uh, proficient technicians that nonetheless could be understood as wonder workers, people capable of miraculous uh, creations in text and an image. And then we had looked uh, last week at the play of scale and size as it worked its way through these various forms of cultural expression, again, from some many centuries ago. And we saw that there, the human frame could be played with in fascinating and intriguing and uh, uh, ways that we can, uh, I think, understand from our present vantage point, in which that human frame would then be recast in disproportionate size as something very small and something very large. Now, today and this afternoon, leading uh, eventually to the conclusion of these lectures in two weeks, we will be examining the matter of still silent texts and images that nonetheless echo, that nonetheless themselves are capable of emotive sound. And I'll be telling you a little bit, but how we go about exploring this seeming paradox of such um, uh, works from many years ago. Now, I've been making a practice here since the Maya are so terribly unfamiliar to many of you, perhaps, and certainly to those who might be streaming on YouTube, of including works that are a little more iconic. And what more iconic image can there be other than the Hoxai's wave, the great wave, uh, which we looked at in the last uh, uh, lecture, than The Scream by Edvard Munch. Now, as many of you know, in the course of his life, he played around in turn with this theme. The painting that you see here before you is one of the most expensive ever procured on the art market at close to $120 million. And so there's a lot of interest in this. But one of the points that you will immediately ascertain is that the mouth is open. Now, Edvard Munch actually described this work um, in a letter, and uh, it was in Norwegian, which I can somewhat access because of my maternal language, Swedish. And he said, there was blood and tongues of fire, not quite grammatical, above the blue-black fjord and the city, Oslo. And I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. So whether it was actually heard or rather felt is something that I'll leave to the side. But this is nonetheless a noisy image that you are perceiving, as would many others in the past, as one that would be replete with sounds that are nonetheless there in a, 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 what is anything other than a recording of um, that scream. There's another kind of more scientific uh, way of projecting sound, which is Schlieren photography. It's frequently employed by ballistic experts. And here you can see um, a weapon being shot and the irradiating, or you might say concentric walls of sound that are passing out in an almost fluid manner. Now, ordinarily you would see this image and you could not hear the explosive retort of this report of this particular weapon, but nonetheless, by means of Schlieren photography, you're able to see it. And so the paradox that I'm looking at today brings us back to this matter of what I would call synesthesia, of using one sense, would be, which would be sight, in order to summon the experience of another, which would be hearing, something very loud and something that might be euphonious or might be discordant. The other thing we can say about this visible sound is it is above all about making something that is innately or inherently ephemeral. Sound itself quickly passes away only as an echo and eventually to dissipate altogether. It is taking that and rendering it into a permanent form. And that is another kind of wonder working that we will see this afternoon, as was practiced by Maya painters in particular and some carvers some many years ago. So to put this another way, think of it in 
the following terms. How do we hear but not hear? How do we experience but not experience directly? And this is a matter of, of fascination to creative spirits among the Maya, uh, as I said before, during their classic period, again, approximately a millennium or more in the past. Today, we'll be exploring these various ways of making the invisible visible. And in part, we'll be looking at a variety of sounds that are implicit in these images, passing first from a mosquito, and we'll go into some detail about this later, buzzing, vexing, enraging, as they often are there at dusk around my tent in the forest. Uh, you know eventually they're going to find skin and, and lead to all sorts of irritations. Another kind of image that we'll be talking about would be this. These are trombones. These are conchs being played. They are booming. They're making loud, modulated tones. But nonetheless, all you're looking at, of course, is an image. And from these, you would, as a knowledgeable viewer, and as you will become knowledgeable viewers during the course of this um, particular lecture, learn how to hear these through another sense. And then finally, there is this image, which is of a shrieking, crying person. This is anything other than the euphonious tone that might be associated with a courtly singer at uh, one of the great dynastic capitals, the Maya. This is the Maya scream. Here you see something as produced by Edvard Munch. Now, this afternoon, we are going to be examining three different topics in turn. I'll give you a little bit of a roadmap just to give you a sense of where we're going. The first topic has to do with the exploration of the meanings and the concepts behind uh, sound and music and wind among the ancient Maya. But as it would be encoded in visual form and that you will also need eventually to access by means of my guiding hand this afternoon. The second part of this talk will de deal with the matter of seeing words. Again, a paradox, if, there, um, if any uh, were, were to exist, that would be one of them. And then finally, we're going to be looking at the mechanics of making sound. And this will leave you, I suspect, with a lasting or sustained feeling of frustration. It's as if you would be looking at a piano and imagining the nimble fingers of someone like Liszt or Beethoven or some other virtuoso of, the, of a more recent vintage. This is what we're dealing with, something so, so close, we can almost hear it, but nonetheless, the voices are forever in the past. Let's start with that first part of the lecture, which has to do with the matter of concepts. And here, there's a critical word which is attested in all surviving Mayan languages. If you will recall from an earlier lecture, for those of you who were able to attend those, there are approximately 29 or so languages. Some are on the verge of extinction. Some are quite robust and spoken by many hundreds of thousands, if not more people. In all of those languages, there is a single word, eek. But it has a suite or a range of meanings that's important to understand at this very juncture, at this onset, at this outset of my talk. For it can mean three possible things. It can mean wind, such as would pass over a gusty afternoon here in the mall in Washington, D.C. It can be breath, or the kind of exhalation that's coming out of my mouth right now. And it can be music. All of these are conjoined semantically in such a way that the Maya would have used them all in, in a, a way that would almost be uh, easily switched out from one to the other. What are the range of concepts? How do we access them? How do we deploy the graphic encoding that I'm going to, again, lead you into understanding this afternoon? Well, the first thing to understand is that their feeling about these evanescent or ephemeral matters of wind, music, and sound, and breath, and so forth, is that they are distilled or encapsulated in material form. They're almost, if you will, bottled, as any fine cognac might be. They're encapsulated within hard structures that nonetheless endure. It takes us into the ultimate result of that contemplation of paradox. One example of this would be shell pectorals. Now, a pectoral is something worn over the chest, and I've inverted this image here to make it clear to you that those two holes, which are highlighted by those red arrows, are the means for suspending something that would be worn over the chest. 
Now, one of the first things I, I hope you'll notice, at least to the few of you here who read my writing, is that the glyphs are wrongly ordered. They've been inverted. They're upside down. And the reason for that is a kind of kinetic accessing of this text in which it is the person who wears the pectoral that can lift it up and read that a hieroglyphic inscription now in a manner uh, that would be completely legible to them. It's intended for the person wearing this particular object. Now let's re return it to its orientation with respect to that text. And we're going to now explore the graphic lineage of a sign that is all important here. Now, it was noticed by some of us uh, a few years ago, um, by me and by David Stewart and others, that quite a few of these shell pectorals have a hieroglyph attached to them. It is a glyphic tag by which the Maya are able to identify an object. And then why are they doing this? So that they can indicate who owns it. They are obsessed with matters, at the elite level at least, of ownership of who has what and who is entitled to which precious object. This particular label for that shell has the sign you see before you. Now, this is from the beginnings of Maya writing. It's probably dating to the first centuries after the beginning of the Common Era. But if we look more carefully at that labeling sign, you will see within it, and I've highlighted it for you in yellow, a T that is a T in our own lettering system, that is the eek sign, which begins to develop. It just so happens as we go beyond those initial centuries of Maya civilization and begin to look at a, a much later stucco uh, object, which shows a, a, a rather corpulent Maya or so on it is one of these pectorals worn over the chest. And you could see, I hope very clearly, the T sign there. What does that T come from? It has been recently argued, I think perceptively and correctly, by Andrew Turner, who is now at the Getty Research Institute, that it began many, many centuries before the Maya as an other kind of pectoral which came from the sea. It was that of the winged oyster. Now, why does he feel this? You'll see that that shell is slightly asymmetrical. One end sticks out further than the other. At some point in the beginnings of the first millennium BC, other peoples, non-Maya speaking peoples, began to render and create these out of jade. That is one of the hardest materials one can possibly imagine. And there is such a pectoral in this T-shaped form. And eventually that becomes for the classic Maya precisely the same as the pectoral being worn by the stucco figure to your left here. This uh, jade example comes from Southern Belize. It was recently excavated by uh, 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 Jeffrey Braswell of the University of California at San Diego. Why is it there? Why does it float over the chest? Because this is the locus of human breath. And as that chest rises and falls with each breath that in itself is a token of vitality and of innate life that allows us to continue, it is something that is linked materially to one of these pectorals. Now, it's a little more complicated even than that. And here I'm going to take you into another set of nuances which enter into the logics behind some of these material forms, these material embodiments of something that you cannot see, of something that would ordinarily be understood as highly ephemeral. For the fact of the matter is many of these shells, and this is something that I've explored in an exhibit I did with Dan Finnemore, it's called The Fiery Pool, and it traveled to a variety of museums about 13 to 14 years ago, is that not a few of these shell pectorals, again, intended to be suspended from the chest, have within them the image of an ancestor. And the ancestors are never shown or seldom shown as fully embodied. They're semi-bodies. There might be a single arm, but above all, there's a head and an identifying hieroglyph. Notice that from the orientational standpoint of these shells, the ancestor is always floating above and looking downwards. Now, what is probably going on here is, as I said before, a kind of cultural logic that I believe we can disentangle uh, persuasively in which the shells would overwhelmingly have come from the Eastern Caribbean Sea. The Maya would have known this at the time, and they would have associated with other kinds of important meteorological phenomena, such as the rising clouds that would then come from East to West, bringing with them the fructifying rains that would allow you to cultivate crops, and eventually to feed your people. 
And so what we're seeing here is a microcosmic effect. Again, it's a witty play of scale of a small shell that can actually be worn in your chest that nonetheless contains the essence of an ancestral breath. Ultimately, that is the gift that is bestowed by the ancestors on us. That is what allows us to live. So the ancestors float above, they come from the sea, and eventually they are placed on the shell as a commemoration of these kinds of personages. But think of the deep cultural lineage that I've just described for you going back centuries upon centuries. So there is, therefore, a tandem understanding here that we've now come to that these material objects worn in the chest that can be held, that can be seen on an occasion can actually be read as to their owner and to the ancestor that would be uh, em embodied on them as the encapsulation of the wind breath essence of ancestors. There are other logics at play here that have to do with that other material I mentioned before with respect to Nimli Punit, and that is hard, hard jade. It's among the hardest that we know about on the Mohs scale. And there is, on a number of carvings, a figure such as this. This is a ruler who's leaning over on an exquisitely carved panel, um, part of a probably a throne or a bench at the city of Palenque excavated about 20 years ago. And if you look very carefully right there by the nose is a perforation. And at one time that probably held a material that has long since disappeared. I would venture and probably with some certainty to say that that at one time it held a piece of jade. What is the logic here? Much, much later, Maya described when de preparing the bodies of the de of a deceased king, placing a, a wad of maize dough in their mouth because the king must continue to consume that food to survive, but also lodging firmly within that maize dough, dough a single jade bead, which would thought was thought to contain the essence of life. Now, this makes sense to some extent of many of the jade beads we see in so far as they too would be not just beautiful objects that would be crafted by great human skill, but as themselves imminent with life. This may account for the fact that not a few Maya depictions, this is of an earlier object, have floating before the faces of some of these ancestral beings a single bead. This is probably the jade bead essence that I've just spoke to you about. It is another housing of spirit in a way that would capture the wind, the breath, the vitality of the ancestors. Now, it also raises in some ways a crisis of representation because we have to ask, is it really there? Is it attached by a string and by painful means to someone's nostril? Or is it rather intended to be there as a way of making that carving complete and endowing it with life? Now, breath and wind, as we'll see music, also were thought by the Maya. This is some work that I've done over the last couple of years as not just a, a kind of force that floats around and that animates and charges life with all of its uh, 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 combustible energy, but rather it could have its own identity. It could have its own will. This is an example of a being, believe it or not, that is painted on the surface of a Maya bowl. It's now in the Museo Popol Vuh in Guatemala. And some years ago, now about 30 years ago, I identified this kind of creature as something called a Y. Now it's a word for sleep. It's a, a, a word for the state that all of us have presumably passed in. I hope you've all had a good night's sleep before coming to hear me today. But it is also an other aspect of the soul. It is an account for why dreaming takes place culturally because it is replete with all sorts of beings that are tied in a firm way to our own sense of self-identity. So think of kings as beings in particular that have these co-essences or alternative companion spirits that make themselves known and identifiable to you at night. This is such a why. And in fact, the glyphs by him, if I can reverse this a little bit, read ik chan, which means the wind sky spirit. Now, I'm going to disentangle a little bit of the rather complex imagery on this eroded image, and you can look at the middle there, and the parts that I've highlighted are five red blotches. And in point of fact, those are all ink signs, but now disposed radially around the central wind that's probably conveying to you the idea of a vortex of considerable power of five winds, the four linked to cosmic directions, and then one to the very center. This is something I explored in my last lecture. 
Now, at, in radiating circles outside of that vortex, that almost tornado of frenetic energy, there would be sparking fires going on, and eventually all the way around a kind of ambient fire that might have arisen routinely in the Maya world on the basis of lightning strikes. Now, I believe we are looking here at a Maya glyph a Maya sign and icon for the hurricanes that lashed this coast and continue to do so on a regular basis and increasingly so because of uh, climate change. So what does this tell us? It tells us that using the same inventory of encoded devices that you should now understand, they're also communicating to us something else about wind, which is it has its own will, potentially, its own forms of intelligence. It can exist on its own. And who, in looking at a hurricane and all of those lists of names, they used to be all female, now they're uh, somewhat degendered, as having distinctive identities as malevolent forces that are scourging the Yucatan and all areas nearby. Another set of related concepts, as I draw you into this material, is to look more at that concept, not of wind or breath, but of music itself. And this is, I believe, exemplified by this carving, which is now on display down at the Kimball Art Museum in the Traveling Maya Show. It is the Maya maze god, who is the aesthetic uh, summit for the Maya, the most beautiful male imaginable. And if you look at his lips, they're parted slightly. His hands are in an alternate alternating manner and the post just so, that's probably a courtship dance. So this is a nubile maze god being ready uh, to enter into a long-term relationship. So this is a concept of the euphonious, of beautiful sound, not of raging hurricanes, but something very, very pleasing to listen to. Now, some years ago, my old um, uh, grad school roommate and uh, a reliable um, a source of great information, Carl Tauba, noticed that there is an other kind of identifiable being associated with euphonious sound, namely of music. And he is another young god. And what the young god is doing here as, is he has shown himself to you, powdered over his body with those same T-shaped eek signs. And by now, you should be able to understand precisely what is being communicated here. Probably they were indicating that this sign would have been on all four limbs, perhaps there in the center as well, being worn as uh, in some way over the body. It's also a sense of directional symbolism. You will see that he's holding two maracas, one on either side, uh, one on either hand, rather, and that his head is angled back ever so slightly to show that he is emitting beautiful sound. And so this is telling us something very important here at the outset of my lecture, which is there is a the capacity for multi-instrumentalism among the Maya performers. They're both using maracas in this alternative, alternating um, rhythm, but at the same time, they're probably singing as well. Some of the gods associated with noisemaking are not that kind of delicate variety we were looking at before, but these are the noisy, hairiest of Maya gods, and this is the rain god. Is there any wonder that a deity associated with those pounding storms that many of us have lived through in northern Guatemala and elsewhere in the jungle would be associated with loud noisemaking? It turns out that in one pot, in fact, in a number of different carvings, this rain god, who we call Chak, is also shown as the musician par excellence. But I think this is noisy, noisy, uh, thumping music, ready for a rave, so to speak. And this deity, is shown often in multiple forms, because the Maya didn't think of gods as singletons, but as ones that would replicate often in ways that might correlate with different directions of the world. The one up above here is playing maracas. Down below is another who is playing a drum. And the drum, I hope you can see, has little spots on the top, and that's from a jaguar pelt that would have covered it. They could be alluding conceivably to the books in which some musical notations were being made, but that's a bit of a speculative uh, inference in my part. And then there at the far back is someone who is playing a turtle shell, but with an ampler rasp. And so I think now you've begun in your minds to summon some of those long, long dissipated sounds that would have existed among the Maya many centuries ago. There would have been this highly percussive substrate, at least to the noisy uh, 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 sound uh, connected with parties, and they would have been multi-instrumentalists. Many sounds are happening concurrently. 
Now, this is prefiguring a little bit a point that I'll be getting to in just a second or so, or a few minutes, which is where are these chalk playing? They are on this pot shown as playing within a cave. And any of you who have visited a Maya cave or indeed a cave anywhere know that they are resonant with all sorts of sounds in which they seem to be disembodied, that float around, that intensify. And if you stand outside of a cave where frequently offerings are still made by Maya today, you will hear sounds coming out. So I think what's going on here is the Maya are showing you probably one of the principal audioscapes, places where sound was produced, and that would be these gigantic sounding chambers, such as the Naktunich cave you see here in Guatemala. This aspect of the deities, which I have now linked to a young god, but also the rain god, is one that also takes us into actual instruments that are at least uh, partly surviving from the time of the classic civilization. Now, this is a handle of a maraca. And of course, the gourd rattle would long since have rotted away in the tomb from which this was found. But what I've done here with it, by means of a a small uh, yellow line and then a red one is showing you what the hieroglyphs are saying on this particular rattle and one links it to the young god of euphonious music. And the one down below is saying that this is the first rattle person, most likely. So this is the inception of music. And we can well imagine that the figure holding this rattle might have been impersonating that god in a kind of sacred way. Uh, a colleague in Germany, Nikolai Grube, with accessing a, a, a collection of looted objects in, 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 in this case, Berlin, has also found other vestiges of rattles, which in this case also tell us by means of hieroglyphs what these rattles were called. And what they call them were the chikab. And what's in crucial here to understand is that one rattle is referring to the object possessed by the sun god. And then the other rattle is though held by a completely different being is the name of the historical figure, in this case, a king of the city of Naranjo in Guatemala, who is impersonating that deity. And we can imagine that there would have been not just one of these rattles, but a, a full panoply of other kinds of garments worn by these people in the act of inter, uh, impersonation. So the gods were there and are always there in acts of sound making. Now, let's go into a, the matter of dynastic production. We've looked at deities. I've given you some insight, I hope, into how they signal these various encodings of sound and music. This is from a, a, a drawing as part of a project that was supervised by my good friend, Mary Miller, who we'll re we will return to in a couple of minutes as a figure I'm going to be citing in the course of this lecture. And these are from the Bonapac murals in um, Chiapas, Mexico, where I've spent uh, a month and a half, a rather hellish month and a half, recording these by means of infrared uh, imagery with a good colleague at, at that time at BYU. These are rattlers. These are people holding maracas, and they too are multi-instrumentalists for reasons that I'll explain in just a second or so. Because if we get into the infrared that I was able to uh, acquire from the surface of this painting, which is very, very poorly preserved now, very difficult to make out some of the details. But it turns out that by means of new uh, technology, as of in this case, about 25 years ago, we can look through that surface and see a rich and luscious carbon under underpainting. And what does it show us? It shows us that each one of these rattles, these maracas, is equipped with an eek sign. In other words, they're both providing you with a sound hole and at the same time, they're showing you what comes out of it. Another hieroglyph nearby that I deciphered about 30 years ago is to me highly revealing here because each one of these maraca players is described not as the player of the chikab we were looking at before or any of the other surviving terms linked to this instrument in the Mayan languages today, but rather this person is called the kayom, the singer. In other words, they're assigning priority to what's coming out of your mouth, and then all of this other instrumentation seems to be ancillary to that main uh, proposition. 
Now, it just so happens this is a title that is even assigned to Amaya kings. You can see that we don't think of King Charles uh, III as someone who's going to be doing any opera work soon. We hope not. We don't imagine that would be too euphonious. But nonetheless, kings among the Maya are being described as people capable of proficient song. Now, this is from, this is the same title, but from a um, a somewhat earlier pot, not by very far. It's from This comes from the city of Tikal, but it has other more revealing details that are not so initially apparent in the eroded glyph we just looked at. So let's look at this youthful head. You can see the mouths are open. There's an elliptical looping line that comes out. And at the very end, in the area that I have highlighted for you in yellow, is a glyph that's flowery, that for the Maya would be understood as something quite florid, floral. So there is here that full possibility of synesthesia, of something beautiful to look at, of something that smells good, and something that's also associated thereby with a kind of paradisical vocalization, something very beautiful indeed. So I've established, therefore, I hope for you, a variety of evidence pointing to the priority of song, above all, and understanding the most beautiful of music. There is also evidence of discordant sound, and it's mostly in the form of three different whistles, uh, which I've assembled for you here, although there are other examples. These are popped out of molds and uh, are, have not been studied all that much by other scholars. But I think all of you can make out here that this is not intended to be euphonious. This is meant to be a, a horrifying angst, a kind of anxious scream coming out of the over-distended, almost dislocated jaws of this person. This is replicated from a number in a number of different figurines. Uh, it, almost certainly it is of a female, as you can see from the example over to the far left. Eerily similar, incidentally, to that horrific figure of Mexican and Guatemalan and Central American folklore, La Llorona, who was a vengeful spirit, uh, 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 very active among the living and horrifying people at night. I don't know if there's any connection here, but there, this is nonetheless a, a female who is shrieking at you in a way that would also synesthetically have been accessible by the ancient Maya. There are also examples, I believe, of indirect evocations of sound that will transport you back to those jungle cities, jungle shrouded cities of 11 to 12 to 1300 years ago. These are heard words. These are words that might have been um, uh, accessible on a daily basis should you be around a figure holding two rattles, as in this image here. Now, this is from the first centuries of the so-called classic period. Arguably, it dates to about 450 to 500 AD. But I, I think you'll notice that not only are there two maracas or rattles with these flowery elements coming out, probably intended to evoke some of those euphonious, euphonious aesthetic matters I referred to before, but embedded within each one of these maracas is a sign that consists of two little lateral uh, dashes. That is the Maya syllable, sha. Now, the words for rattle in a variety of Mayan languages are nothing like sha. The, the words for rattles tend to be ones that I think are onomatopoeic. There's what they might have heard. So they would be like, tso, 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 chin, 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 chin. I think you yourself can hear immediately that that would correspond to the sound coming out of maraca. And instead, I think what they're providing you with here is by means of the syllable, they're also giving you that susuration, that rattling sound that is meant to be evoked here, the sound that is there uh, recorded in the syllable and also placed in that marvelously explicit way by the Maya carver on this incised pot from about uh, 1400 to 1500 years ago. This world of onomatopoeia, of sounds that then become labeling words, as opposed to ones that are simply evoked by showing this or that syllable, have to do with the rich resources linguistically that come from all of those descendant Mayan languages. Now, we don't know that all of them were descended directly from the ancient Maya uh, language recorded in the script, but they would have probably provided us with a sense of what the possibilities were. And there are, is, for instance, the word for beat is boom, 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 or the word for gagging noise uh, 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 would be 
somewhat similar to what you might hear if you uh, before the Heimlich maneuver or any other kind of uh, medical uh, application. And then there's tsun, tsun, which is that for the ringing bell. In other words, they use these onomatopoeic, onomatopoeic devices in order to create whole new words. And this is something that we see also played out in a variety of Maya syllables. Now, this is a, a sign that shows a vulture leaning over to pluck out the eye of a rotting creature, some sort of mammal, could be a jaguar in some cases. I'm not sure that's the case here. This too would be synesthetic, but now it would be indicating to you the malodorous quality of a rotting creature out there in the, under the uh, tropical sun, which is of some intensity, as I can tell you. That sign in total reads, we know from a great deal of evidence, e, e, e. that is a word that is attested in some Mayan languages. And this has been studied fruitfully by my colleague at Tulane University, Mark Sender, and that there is a kind of bird called an e. But many Maya words for birds probably come out of these onomatopoeic origins or sources. Even words like uk for quetzal, or mo or wek wek for a kind of woodpecker. They are reproducing sounds that are not accessible to us other than simply listening to the woodpecker today or the cries being made by some of these creatures. Now, one of my favorite examples of an onomatopoeic um, uh, uh, origin would be this strange, rather baroque looking creature. This is a Maya mosquito. And why do we know it's a mosquito? Well, first of all, it has the exoskeleton of a kind of bug. It has the multi-ocular uh, apparatus, many, many eyes that they would associate routinely in Maya glyphic imagery and in, in this kind of imagery, painted imagery, with bugs, with insects. And you also notice the long, long proboscis coming out and that is, of course, what would be associated with a mosquito, in addition to the excreted blood that comes out down below, and then these gouts of blood coming out from the mouth itself. It turns out that this is almost certainly the explanation for a Maya syllable. This is the syllable ya. Now, that to the side is from a text at the site of Yaschilan in Chiapas, Mexico. It has that long, long beak coming out. It's a little flower attached to it, probably some gender confusion. The Maya were not entomologists. They're not distinguishing between the water that would be consumed by a male mosquito versus the blood that would be required by the female to lay eggs. But we do know, thanks to... An, observation by David Stewart some decades ago, that here too are these volutes, these gouts of blood that signal to us that even though it is stone, it's long lost, lost its paint, is something that is bloody mouthed. So what is going on here? I believe since this is not the word for mosquito, there's no word that corresponds to ya, they are reproducing that high, ir irritating, most vexing sound that tends to surround you, particularly at dusk, if you find yourself in the middle of a swamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, probably going back and forth from high vowels uh, one to the other. That was the first part of my lecture, and I hope I've now given you some instruction in how to look at these images, and I've given you a sense of some of the range or variety of meanings that are so crucial in understanding what's going on here. The second part of my talk is going to be dealing with seeing words, and again, that takes us full force into this realm of paradox that's so, so difficult to uh, fathom. Now, this is a, the lone image, uh, there might be a very few others, but this is a, a scene not at Brown University where the professors drone on and on, as I can tell you, but there is an ever attentive student, I've never seen one like quite like this, who is not speaking at all because there by him is an elderly male professor, in this case a deity, who is speaking as indicated and signaled by this looping line that is coming out from his lips and eventually connecting with a record of that speech up to the side and over to the top. There's a great deal of comparative evidence of seeing words in the different parts of the world. And again, I'm trying to coax you into an understanding of the Maya by looking at examples that might be a little more familiar to you, or if not, from civilizations that underscore how this is an important human preoccupation generally. This is a carving that comes from a temple in Kyoto, so obviously non-Maya, it dates to the early uh, 13th century AD, and it's from a, a, a particular school of Buddhism that's involving, uh, in this case, a monk called Kuya. 
If we look carefully at this monk, we are seeing incarnated sound word that is being expressed as six small Buddha images, which are attached by means of metal wire coming out of the mouth of this monk. He is forever speaking to you, despite the fact that he's gone on to nirvana long ago. It is thought by many specialists that those six syllables correspond to the kind of incantatory utterance being made in chants of this particular tradition of Buddhism in which they are reading, Nama um, excuse me, um, um, Amida Butsu. Obviously, I don't speak uh, Japanese, but I can tell you that those are the six syllables which are always there floating in front of his mouth. Now, I think what they're doing here probably is there are lots of discourses in Buddhism about the transitory nature of the world, and they would probably delight in playing around with this, as you can see from the chant that is forever memorialized by these small figures of the Buddha, leading eventually to the salvation of all those who would undertake that chant. Now, there is a European example. Um, much uh, in mind here is, is England, perhaps because of what's going on in, uh, in the United Kingdom with the recent enthronement of uh, King Charles. This is from an earlier king and one who is, I suspect, a far more nastier customer. This is from Henry VIII. And this is a, a, a frontispiece to the Great Bible in English that was commissioned by none other than Thomas Cromwell. Within a year, his head is off of his body on Tower Hill. He had offended the king by picking, a, I'm, I'm told, an unattractive bride, not one to Henry VIII's uh, liking. I'm sure there was much more complexity involved there. But if we look very carefully at the bottom of this document, you will see that in the European tradition as well, as you can also make out by going through the galleries of the National Gallery, particularly uh, of art, particularly over in the Renaissance uh, section and late Middle Ages, of words that float in front of human lips as though they're recorded on scrolls. And here, if we look very carefully, close up at this frontispiece in St. John's College in Cambridge, you will see first learned people who are saying, Vivat Rex. They're versed in Latin in the language of the, of the educated. And then there is an adult leaning over to children, again, notably silent. They're there to receive knowledge, not to hustle and bustle and make too much noise. And here they've switched to English and they're saying, God save the king. And they're incarcerated to the right-hand side of this image are those odious papists who have nothing to say at all. So this is a, an expedient that is widely used in traditions around the world. How it, do we see words among the ancient Maya? Well, we see them first in the form of birds. This is a very early mural that comes from San Bartolo in Guatemala, beautifully painted by um, Heather Hurst, my good colleague. And look very carefully at this image, and you'll see all of these little squiggles, including one coming out of a bird, a duck, often associated with wind and music and storms. And they are sometimes connecting the text, often not in this case, but the birds themselves are issuing all sorts of sounds. This is a, almost to me like the Maya book of Genesis. It is telling you about the origins of all things. And mimetically, they're replacing human sound coming out of human lips. They're back as something that would come out of the, the, the beaks of birds. The fact that there is a wind day sign floating right in front of you, it cannot be a coincidence. Now, this idea of words being shown is also frequent in a lot of Maya pots, and I'll be returning to this theme in the final lecture of the series. This is a um, uh, definitely a Me Too moment here with an old god. He's famously lecherous. He's associated with wealth. You can see all sorts of moralizing going on here. Uh, and there in front of him are these beauties who probably represent his harem. But if, again, I mute that background so you can highlight a little bit in your own eyes what's being depicted here in this image, there is that volute coming out and notice its beautiful elliptical quality. It's looping, it is moving around with all of the complexity that courtly language might. It, there's an aesthetic dimension here. And it's one that also, as my co pointed out, my advisor at Yale now passed away many years ago, it infuses the art itself. And so just as the art might communicate sound so the sound is communicating visual aesthetics. And this was described by Mike Coe as the whiplash line. And so you had 
uh, Indiana Jones or some other strange neocolonial figure whipping uh, his uh, bullwhip and snapping at the very end. And it was Mike's keen observation uh, at this point about 40 years ago that this whiplash, which is associated with speech scrolls, is also there frequently as a terminus, as an ending on some of the lines that are being deployed by this calligrapher. There is another aspect here, which may even communicate the discontinuous nature of speech. This is the lecture scene of the droning professor, I hope I'm not doing it this afternoon, in which the first words coming out of this uh, elderly god's uh, mouth are disjointed. They're almost like a dash line, as though they're telling someone about indicating to you something about the uh, uh, the hesitant nature of speech, as sometimes it's true even in public lectures like this, eventually achieving steam and momentum and connecting to the text nearby. So that's a mythic scene of instruction. There are some other aspects of speech and of song, which are found, for instance, on this shell, which is now in the Princeton Art Museum, uh, one of the greatest repositories of pre-Columbian art. The elongated gesture of this figure, it's made out of shell, the fact that he's holding a rattle, I hope you can make that out, the fact that he also has a kind of angular speed scroll coming out of his uh, uh, mouth with small little knobs attached to it tells us there's something afoot here. And Simon Martin and I, in a paper we recently gave at our national archaeology meetings, argue that this is a, a warrior who is non-local. And the angular properties of the speech and song coming out here may be telling us that this object, which has often been dated far too earlier than I think its actual date at the end of classic Maya civilization, is telling us and showing you that this this is the song of foreigners, and this might be possibly explaining some of the strange attributes or properties here, but there can also be even echoes that are being conveyed by Maya art. Now, this is a rollout pot of a pot that's in the St. Louis Museum of Art, and I was joking to Stephen Nelson earlier, this person, this painter, has lots of cultural information here, but probably gets an F when it comes to deployment of the brush on the surface. I wish they would have kept their lines straight. What it is showing is a ball playing scene. You can see athletes down below, and they are arrayed against stairways, which Mary Miller and I wrote about many years ago um, in a journal article. I believe this pot is showing echoes, and I'll develop that argument right now by looking at some of the other music making going on. Someone is blowing a conch, a shell from the sea, and also you can imagine that it has all of those ancestral resonances we looked at at the very beginning of this lecture. And then over the side, there are people playing maracas, and their lips are open because they are in full-throated song. Now let's get a little bit closer. And I'm going to look at this point. I'm going to emphasize or highlight for you Whiplash lines, but not connected to mouths. They simply float around as though disconnected from the human body. I believe this is a supremely clever means by which the Maya are showing the echoic, the echoing nature of their architecture. And of course, imagine the cries that you are synesthetically hearing here and looking at the energetic motion of ball players here in this closed off setting. It's disembodied and it is telling us something very about, very interestingly about the confused and broken nature of the sounds that you would hear. It is potentially also indicated by another curious attribute of the text on this pot, which is many of the texts are backwards. They're spelled backwards, as though words themselves become topsy-turvy within the jumbled setting acoustically of one of these uh, places. So we are here in the final part of my lecture going to explore the matter of making sound. So we've looked at what are the meanings substantively of sound and music and wind. We've looked at how words might be depicted. Now let's look at how it's actually produced. And we have to invoke here the concept of an audioscape. I'm in an auditorium here. Presumably you could hear me. You might be able to hear me if I were speaking. It's being assisted electronically here. We believe a lot of Maya uh, landscapes, the centers of cities, places such as the ball courts we just saw in that um, pot from the St. Louis Museum of Art, are themselves probably configured to create certain sounds. Now, I do believe there are many that were non-deliberately configured in the sense that you would hear barking dogs, you, you would hear uh, calls of people, there might be song, you would hear drums, you, you might even hear assaulting uh, troops coming in or warriors leaving or dances, you might hear music. 
But these would not necessarily always be um, there to be interpretable. But the fact of the matter is, in addition to all that, the song, the sound of everyday life in Amaya City, almost certainly there were intentional landscapes. And this is something we need to be paying more attention to in studies of Maya architecture. These are the deliberately configured audioscapes. Now, this takes us into the deliberate sound making of a sort that begins to evolve more than a single player of a maraca. This is a figurine, and so it's innately, inherently involved in creating sound. And it shows, uh, you know, in a way I'll describe in a, a, just a minute or so, how these sounds were brought together in assemblies, how they were brought together almost in a orchestral manners. Some of the sound simply comes from moving the human body. It's by having objects on you that are going to be releasing a certain kind of sound. And that might be, for instance, in these examples that I excavated with colleagues from a royal tomb in northern Guatemala, a shell with all of the resonances semantically that we looked at before, but also with single little plugs of shell attached to them. And you can imagine when the person wearing this would move, you'd hear that clinking noise. There would also be little clappers inserted into these shells, also coming from a distant place, far away from their eventual uh, location in this royal tomb, as many as 200 dogs died to gave up their lives, their godly, their dogly, uh, dogly bodies, canine bodies, in order to create the sounds that would come from these clappering motions, the kind of percussive sounds uh, uh, that would be worn by the royal dancer. These are kingly paraphernalia. They'd be worn by a ruler. There's another kind of object that's very frequently uh, discussed in Maya literature, and these are jade adzes. Adzes uh, meaning an axe, spelled A-D-Z-E, and you could see that it's perforated up above, and that's because it would have been suspended from a belt, again, to be vigorously shaken and, and uh, moved. Now, you probably know that in Asia, there's a lot of evidence anciently of stone chimes that would be struck to create music. And I believe the Maya would use these in much the same way. This is a, almost a unique example or very, very one of a few examples in which there's a self-reference to that celt or adz, that polished uh, jade axe, being worn by the figure on it. That just so happens that the Maya occasionally describe what these objects are, and they tell us that there are two different words applied to them. One would be the kaiwak, a, a term I noticed many, many years ago and when I first began getting involved in decipherment. And uh, Mark Zender, uh, my colleague, has argued persuasively that it probably comes from a word for thunderbolt. So these would be objects descending from the sky, eventually to be exhumed and then uh, lovingly uh, shaped into this manner to be worn eventually. But uh, Mark Zender has also noted that a, there is an other a tag or label attached to these in which they're called the which is they are the noisemakers. And so they're providing us, the Maya are by direct means, evidence that these are meant as much to be musical as they are precious objects. This shell, this um, extraordinary um, a uh, uh, conch trumpet is in fact one of these objects. It's called an ukesa or ukesa, and then it's telling us that it belonged to a hunting god. That's because these sorts of uh, shells would probably been used in coordinating activities of hunters. But the fact that ukesa also means to weep and to mourn indicates something of the adjectival attributes that would be associated with these sorts of sounds as being mournful and weeping. And we're beginning to enter in here into an understanding of how the, the Maya would have categorized different kinds of sound, whether happy or not. Now, some years ago, I began to look a little bit um, more at this matter of instrumentation. And I happened to be on a trip to, um, this is quite the junket, to uh, Angkor and to the Cambodian National Me uh, Museum in, in Phnom Penh. And there I was astounded to see this object uh, there below uh, a local specialist employed by the French government. And these are in very long pieces of stone that have been napped much in the same way that any lithic or chert or piece of obsidian might be. These have been found in some numbers and is widely accepted in South Asian archaeology. This is also be true in Vietnam, that we are examining here before you lithophones, 
things that would be struck by mallets. Uh, there are many examples on YouTube that are worth looking at, and that would have been calibrated in a way that really needs to be studied with the CELT, the ESA that we were looking at before. These are completely unstudied as far as I can tell. Now, I'm somewhat aware of archaeological developments being, in addition to a specialist in my writing, an archaeologist, and it became clear to me that these kinds of objects are found not routinely, but they do appear, particularly in what is now Belize. From the human hand, you can make out the size of these. They're getting awfully close to the lithophones that are well attested there in Southeast Asia, in, in the civilizations of that part of the world. I believe these are lithophones and that they need to be studied from the viewpoint of what sounds might be emitted from them when appropriately struck by a mallet. Now, there is another kind of instrumentation, uh, instrumentation. I'm deliberately exposing you to uh, unusual things that have not been noted by many other sc scholars. And one is stilt stamp stamping. If you can imagine, and this would really make this an engaging presentation more so than is now, if I could have given this talk with stilts on, I think you would be very amused as I tumbled about, but also you would have heard that thumping sound as my legs went up and down. It turns out that there are a few instances, including on this pot shirt that was excavated at the city of Kalakmul in Campeche, of someone who's blowing, blowing a straight trumpet of the sort that would have been seen routinely, let's say, in Middle Age uh, Europe. And then down below, his feet are attached to stilts. And then over to the side is a separate group of musicians who are pounding a drum. Therefore, there's a musical aspect to this. There's a percussive aspect, which would have melded together in a perfect fusion. Dance, which would have created sounds quite literally through elements of the costume, but also through the thumping of the feet. The instrumentation here that we're beginning to get glimpses of to give us a sense of the complexity of potential um, orchestration among the Maya. This is a pot that's now in Australia of all places, and it shows you up above a large trumpet form. And notice that the body of the musician is just going off camera, so to speak, behind the plaster, the pillar of a palace. The little stick attached to it with a rope around it suggests very strongly, as has been pointed out by Carl Talba and others, that this is a trombone, that you were, it would allow the musician to elongate the sound of that trumpet to achieve a kind of dense modulated sound. And down below is a hand that is holding a conch and his hand is inserted within its uh, intersection here. And you can well imagine too, the variable muting that would allow that sound also to become a weeping and lamentation of the sort that we had looked at before with a conch trumpet. And so this is opening a world uh, uh, to us of an instrumentation that has only been barely glimpsed before. Now, just a few um, months ago, I noticed yet another example, which would be worthy of Louis Armstrong or Beale Street, let's say in Memphis, in which these, and it's a very eroded pot, so you'll have to bear with me, but these hands are elongated, they're extending out, and the hands are partly cupping one of these straight trumpets. And it just so happens that this individual is named to the side, and he seems to be called an atikabhom, which arguably means he of the mouth hand trumpet. In other words, there could have been special capacities, special training involved in performing these. I don't believe that these musicians were people that just happened in off of the street, so to speak. They would have also been trained as much as any gamelan orchestra might have been in a dynastic setting in Southeast Asia in their intricacies of these performances. And I have to believe that notations existed, but at last none uh, survive. Now, there's a mimetic aspect to sound here as we're getting to the conclusion of my lecture, which has to do with where do sounds come from. If you turn back to what I mentioned before about San Bartolo, you saw that the sounds eventually came or can be said to have come at, in the first dawn of existence out of the beaks of birds. It was something that was thought to be very beautiful, very paradisical. We see these mythical orchestrations, which in themselves betoken human ones, as on this figure. Now, let me disentangle for you some of the figures, some of the personages who might have been on this whistle. There's a frog. These are very noisy creatures, particularly in the beginning of the rainy season, to my great distress, if you try to get any sleep in a jungle camp. Now, down below are other animals, and you'll notice that they, too, are playing some instruments. This is a whistle category of which I found about two to three other examples. 
Um, the one in the middle uh, is holding a rattle and the one to the lower left is holding a drum. And then there in the middle, and I find this endlessly interesting, are two ewes. They're much smaller figures of the sort that we've described in earlier lectures. I believe the Maya are very attentive here to alto registers, not to castrati, if you know about this uh, very strange concept from Europe, maybe it exists among the Maya. People are castrated in order to preserve that voice over time, but very much aware of choristers who are going to be achieving an alto register that would be able to leaven and to beautify and to make utterly more, com ultimately more complex one of these fuller orchestrations. Stilt walkers, stilt pounders are not just found on that potsherd. There is also this roll-out vase, which also is mythic. Now, we looked at that whistle. It contained frogs. Ordinarily, we don't know how to train frogs to make uh, systematic music. We have to presume that the Maya are indicating something mythic in origin, and so too here. What we see on this rollout of a pot is first a cave. Think of that again as the most basic kind of performance arena, which is going to have distinctive sonic properties for the Maya. Out of that cave are issuing musicians. You can imagine this sound here. I hope now it is summoning and conjuring in your ears some of the impact and some of the full sonic impacts here, uh, indeed, of, of this kind of performance. And there, what do we see is a, a turtle with antler rasp. And the next image I'll highlighted for you, this vignette, is a standing drum. Presumably, these would be more difficult to move. So you can imagine that would be positioned, and then the other musicians might be coming around it. It's a floor drum. And then there is someone holding maracas. And then finally is our stilt dancer. He is impersonating the rain god himself. And there's obviously all sorts of meteorological effects that are being summoned here as well. The fascinating thing about this text and this pot is that they're not only giving you this background information, but they're probably giving you a glyph for orchestrations. This is something I noticed a few years ago. Because the figure holding a maracas, who's youthful, who's beautiful, someone you would associate with um, all of the euphonious qualities of music here, is someone who has in front of his name, as part of his name glyph, right in front of his uh, head, but probably describing the scene more generally, the word chuck eek, which I think means the great music. This is not only indicating boisterous volume, but probably something that also is showing a, a great skill and preparation. And the text gets even more interesting because below and just to the side of the stilt dancer, what do we see is a text, which is fairly unambiguous in reading in Maya, which means on this date, which is probably there at the beginnings of time, rises up. What rises up? Well, it is the music or wind feet or foot. They are describing here, in their own words, a kind of instrumentation and a kind of uh, uh, a form of music that is indeed decodable from the imagery in collusion with uh, hieroglyphic decipherment. And notice what this person's doing. His head is leaning backward. You know by now that that is signaling a robust throaty voice. You know that he is dancing because of the sounds being made by the stilt, and you know that ultimately the figures on the throne to the side are enjoying this music greatly. Let us conclude here by going into the dynastic setting by which all of these primordial or mythic progenitors are also being found more uh, specifically in a dynastic or royal context. What better instance of this would there be than the Bonampak murals that I alluded to before and that I studied with Mary Miller and her team uh, at this point about 20 to 25 years ago? Now, this is a highly artificial image. It's a little like the rollout of a Maya pot, and that the a single room in the Bonapak mural is arguably among the greatest artistic productions of antiquity anywhere in the world have been rolled out for you, but you can imagine that there in the lower right-hand side is an opening. That's the door by which you uh, eventually enter this chamber. It, these murals show motion, and you can imagine that some of the musicians in this bottom register, who I'll be telling you some detail about details about later, have entered through the doorway and are moving in this order. It is the counterclockwise motion of ritual mo movement, which we'll be talking about in the next, cl next class, next lecture. Uh, I, I'm just fixated on you being my students. I hope you are. Um, uh, and you will be graded harshly.
Um, and you can make out other musicians coming in around. And th this is, as Mary has pointed out very insightfully, Mary Miller, a, a form of virtuality, virtual reality of the sort that the Maya would, would uh, were experimenting with long before uh, Mark Zuckerberg had, had decided to uh, uh, distribute his fortune in this direction. And that you would sit within this chamber and again synesthetically you would not be listening to the bird cries outside or the, the the chatter of monkeys you would be listening to this orchestra now there are focal performers here and those are three princes as i've written about in a book called um the gifted passage who are dancers and probably singers and you'll notice uh, the intense mutilation of their surf uh, of the surface of their faces and this is probably quite deliberate one is very young we know this uh because he is uh we have other information to this uh, degree. The very central figure who probably has uh, among the most uh, systematic violence as does his brother to the side is someone who may or may not have come to the throne. And it's part of the ambiguity and ambivalence of Maya carvings that some of the figures who are highlighted within it are in point of fact, people that just blip out of history. Their, their, their works in some ways, supreme dynastic frustration. Now, the other thing we can say about this these musicians is that they're ordered in a way that Mary Miller noticed years ago in a rather cheeky title called The Boys in the Band after the 1960s movie, I, I think, or play. It's somewhat before my time. But what, it des what she described in that article, and I think she's spot on, is that there was a systematic arrangement to how these musicians might have occurred across the surface of these murals, and indeed not just there. They would start with maracas in addition to the singers, the dancers. And then you would have the standing drum. This sounds a little bit like the pot we're just looking at. You'd have the turtle shell rasps. And then there would be a variety of uh, water gods playing split drums. And then these great booming trumpets, not trombones in this case. And then coming there at the very end is someone with a tiny and rather ineffectual whistler. He must have felt right ridiculous. Now, these scenes are ones that, and this is something I've noticed separately. I don't know if Mary's made this observation. Mary Miller's made this observation, is that this is a pattern found across ancient America, particularly in areas such as the Mishtec region. This is a book dating to uh, some centuries before the Spanish conquest. And though it's, it's somewhat reversed, it nonetheless has exactly the same kind of pattern in which we have maraca players, we have someone uh, with some kind of um, apparently trombone or, or, or trumpet. It's even mounted there on some great scaffold. You can imagine it's a little like an alpen horn which is probably the most infelicitous musical instrument i can think of out and then you have a standing drum and that there to back is another split drum it's re replicating to some extent the precise ordering we just saw centuries earlier in a radically different concept in bonampak now it doesn't again take a great deal of perception but it, it's something that immediately became clear to me that these are acoustical configurations and they're probably aware of the softer sounds that would occur, for instance, in the orchestra as it developed in the Western world from the Baroque period on and eventually its classical instances in which you go from the singer, you have the violins, these much higher pitched uh, kind of instruments. It goes back to the wind instruments. And then there at the back is the uh, rather large uh, timpani uh, drums, including the bass viol. In other words, they seem to be passing here almost in a cross-cultural way from light sounds eventually back in the booming ones. This kind of audio landscape is one that is, again, very similar to what you might see in its fullest orchestral form. It's like a Mahler symphony almost there at Bonham Park, in which you go from singers to maracas to standing drums to split drums, trumpets, and possibly there as a kind of anomaly, as a fun one. Maybe it's kind of a joke of the whistle. This is not only among the Maya. It is not only among the civilizations of central Mexico. It also occurs in ancient China. And this is something I just noticed a couple of days ago, which is if you turn to one uh, extraordinary tomb excavated, uh, I believe, in the 1970s, uh, the Marquis um, Z of Yang. This is a, a time of some tumult. and uh, But nonetheless, uh, a full orchestra, not necessarily with people, but the orchestration itself, the instruments, were buried in a very similar way in which you have zithers in front. They go back to slightly harsher instruments. And then finally to the great bells or chimes that are frequently on traveling exhibits and which can be seen in, in museums today in China. 
And then over to the side is a bronze model showing a chamber version of this fuller orchestration in which there is, again, singer, a set of singers in front, then we have these instruments that are slightly softer, and then it goes all the way back to those great bass booming drums. And the fascinating thing is, if you look at the plan of this tomb, the figure who is perpetually and perennially accessing and enjoying this pleasurable music is none other than the principal occupant of this tomb uh, from um, the first millennium AD and from the age of Confucius. He is the audience. His grave, his, his sarcophagus is in the chamber directly across from it. He is the sole audience that matters. And that would also be true, presumably, of this bronze model over to the side. It would have been situated in a tomb. And so ultimately, expanding in turn somewhat of what Mary Miller had to argue, I believe we're looking at here at the kind of variety that would be recognizable to anyone going to hear a chamber music ensemble, and then all the way to a large orchestra of the sort that might uh, highlight uh, civic and cultural life in a place like Boston or, or, or uh, any of the capitals of Europe. It is expandable and it's collapsible. And these were probably signal offices within the courts of the royal kingdoms. And so to conclude here, I've done is I've hopefully taken you on an interpretable and intelligible journey through how sounds are made and what sounds mean among the ancient Maya of a long time ago, many, many years ago. It is exemplified by the bird. It has a speech scroll, a singing scroll, looping out of his mouth. There's a little sign for green, probably affixed to his um, uh, forehead. It's a glyphic label to tell you that it was a green bird, just to make it perfectly clear. And we're seeing here that the Maya had this ability, this genius, for taking something that was intrinsically ephemeral and making it permanent, making it enjoyable in the long term. Where did those sounds begin? Begin. They began in their thought to pre-human capacities, to those beautiful sounds that we heard in the jungle that they appreciated, to the sounds that might come and be made by gods long before humans came on the scene. We've also seen and understood, I hope today, some of the complexity of these orchestrations, which were, again, contemplating that piano and hoping against hope that we can hear whatever sounds might have been made by Franz Liszt uh, over uh, almost 200 years ago. That's an impossibility. What we can do, though, is to look at the the variety of instrumentation. I, I, we're probably just touching the surface on this. More evidence will come to light of all of the sounds that they were able to make to such a sophisticated extent. We've seen also something of how they crafted their cities and, and, and used natural features such as caves in order to configure audio landscapes that would have maximized enjoyment. And ultimately, as music does, if we've attended any uh, a church choir, we are elevated by that. We are taken to a different place. And this is something that is being afforded you in interpreting the images here. I cannot believe that these are unrehearsed activities. I cannot believe that these were not carefully thought through, that Training in these various skills were something that uh, were, were things that were carried on from childhood on. So ultimately, I would end by saying that we are examining here a kind of cultural triumph, one in which sounds are made visible, and to some extent, in meanings that we're just beginning to explore, they are subverting ephemerality. They are making something that would dissipate within a second or so into a graphic display that is accessible to you here in this basement of the National Gallery many, many centuries later. And by this means, I hope I have taken you from a lost world that is forever still and the one that is booming with beautiful sound. Thank you.